No problem. All right. So writing research papers on psychology. There are so many things that I'm sure you guys have already learned in your Psych 2 classes and all the other cool things that you guys are doing to write these papers. If it's in you know, Psych 2, if it's faculty mentored research. So I'm giving kind of a broad overview of papers in general. And then I'm gonna really dive in to what's called a reference management software. That's something that you guys will understand at the end of this uh, meeting today they're super, super helpful. It has been life changing for me to start using one. So I really wanted to give you guys my knowledge on that so that you can take advantage of it a lot earlier than I did. I didn't learn about this until just this year and it would have been so helpful to me in undergrad and my master's program if I had known about these things. So just to start off with the basics of writing psychology research papers. Traditionally, we write them according to APA format that usually includes having it double spaced and one inch margins. As for like font size and what font you choose, those are kind of negotiable. The only APA requirement is that it needs to be accessible and legible. So there are some standards like you, you could use Calibri 11, you could use Arial 11 or Times New Roman 12. All of those are really, really well accepted, but as long as it's readable, there's some flexibility there. Now, all the details about APA format can be found in the APA publication manual. They update it about every 10 years or so, and the current version was published in 2019 in the fall, and that's APA 7, and that's an image of the actual manual there on the right. You can ask pretty much any grad student or professional in psychology who writes a lot of papers, that thing becomes your best friend. I always have it within arm's reach at my desk and I refer to it often for you know, little formatting questions like how do I write a reference for a conversation I had with someone who's an expert in the field. The publication manual will have details on that for you. So when I was a student, I did buy the previous version and I got this one, literally pre-ordered it as if it was like a video game that I wanted. And it's really just kind of a nerdy thing, but I love having it because it's really, really easy to access and find whatever I need in there. When we're looking at a research paper according to APA format, there are some general sections that we'll have. There'll be a title page with headers. Those are kind of different depending on if you're a student or if you're a professional. So just keep that in mind if you're ever formatting something that you wanna follow either the student formatting or the professional formatting depending on where you are in your career. There will always be an abstract. And then generally, we follow a structure of having a literature review, a proposed study, measures, results, discussion, and references. Now, I say generally here because this can depend a little bit on the structure of the paper you're writing and the intention. If you were to write a paper that's intended to be kind of a meta-analysis, looking at a lot of different literature across a specific field, then you might not have a proposed study, measures, or results. It's going to be pretty much bulk literature review and discussion. So again, it can kind of just depend. But to dive into the part that we're really interested in talking about today, that's going to be references. So when we're looking at references, I want to introduce you guys to Zotero. Zotero is a reference management software. Its entire purpose is to manage your references for you so you don't have to do it manually. Basically, if you had to do it manually, you have to go through and read these articles, save them somewhere, take your notes somewhere, and you have a lot of different places that you would go. For me personally, if I download an article as a PDF, I like to highlight on it. I like to leave notes in the margins. And I would usually end up doing that in like Acrobat or OneNote or something like that. And then when I want to find my notes, I need to go article by article to try and find the specific things I'm looking for. So Tero makes that really, really seamless. You can import all of your articles directly into the software and it's going to organize them for you. And I'll get into a little more detail about that. When we're looking at all the different reference management softwares, there are a lot of them, but I personally like Zotero for a number of reasons. First of all, it's free and who doesn't love a free software? Super easy to use, super intuitive. Once you kind of get the hang of it, it's really easy to continue to use it for all your projects. It can also sync easily across multiple devices and it can do that online through Zotero.org or you can download the software directly to your device. I personally have a desktop computer and a laptop. I use both of them pretty evenly in terms of what I'm using for my day-to-day -day work. So it's really cool that if I find something on my desktop, I can save it to Zotero and it will appear on my Zotero library in my laptop as well. 
Zotero is also compatible with Word and Google Docs, which I think are the two processing softwares that we use the most in, for writing our papers. There's also cloud and local storage. So you can store all of your Zotero data onto your device itself, or they have a great cloud. And their cloud storage, it's a lot. I don't remember exactly how much it is, but you can also upgrade that over time if you need to, and it's relatively inexpensive. Now, when I say that though, you likely won't need to pay for extra storage right away. I know a lot of friends who are in grad school that have been using Zotero for years and have yet to need that. So it's gonna depend a little on your individual needs, but it's a really, really great resource. Now, why should you consider using a reference software? First of all, your citations are gonna be more accurate. You can actually get Zotero to generate your citations and create your bibliography for you. And I've got some screenshots of the software later in this slideshow that I'll show you guys so you can kind of see the different options you have, but ultimately it's going to be more accurate than if you were to do it manually. It's also great for big projects. Personally, I just started my dissertation and I'm expecting to read hundreds, if not thousands of articles in the next year or so as I work on my dissertation. And because of Zotero, I know that all of those different things will be very well organized and easy for me to sort through. And in the future, if I need to find a reference, it'll be easier to go back. For example, I actually got an email from my advisor yesterday saying, hey, I really need a reference for this specific thing. I know that you have one somewhere. Do you know what it is? And I was easily able to search my tags in Zotero to find the exact reference that she needed in a matter of minutes. Now, like I said, it makes it very easy to create those citations and reference pages because it's going to do it all for you. You don't need to individually add your citations onto a bibliography. Zotero can actually spit out a complete bibliography for you. you that'll help you a lot in writing stronger literature reviews because you have one place that you can access all this information. It's easier to draw connections between different subjects, different authors, different publications. This also just helps you develop a database for yourself. You are all going through this process of learning and writing together. And as you're doing that, you're going to find a lot of really interesting articles that you will refer back to over the years. So this is really just building a virtual library for yourself of all the articles that have been useful to you throughout your academic career. And like I said, you can connect ideas based on num a number of things. We can look at author, topic, the year that it was published, the conversations around it, the notes that you added, and you can search very, very seamlessly within the software itself. Now, I know that that's a lot of information I'm spitting at you, and you might be wondering how exactly does organizing things in Zotero work? So there are a few different things that you can use to organize within Zotero. First are tags. Tags are basically the topics being discussed in an article. When you import into Zotero, it's automatically going to generate tags for you based on what keywords the author has specified in their paper. Now, sometimes Zotero will try to be smart and do it a different way, and it's not always as seamless as you would want it to be, but you always have the option to add tags on to something. So for example, if I want to tag, oh, this is a great reference for my dissertation and also for something else, I can add a tag that's personal to me just so I can remember why I like this reference. You also have collections. So basically, I see collections as projects. So I have a collection for my dissertation. I have a collection for another paper that I'm working on. I have a collection of references that I got from one of my friends and my research lab. So each of these different collections are basically like folders within your Zotero library where you can put all of the different articles that are relevant to whatever that collection is for. Now you also can add notes. This includes highlights, insights, and questions. As you're reading through the articles, you can read them actually in Zotero and add your highlight, add notes on as you like, and it will keep all of those things organized within those collections and have those tags so that every time you wanna find something specific, it's really easy and seamless to do so. It also is going to pull the abstracts from all the papers. So you can seamlessly just click on your article and you'll see the abstract right next to it. And it's really easy just to see a quick summary and refresh your mind on what that article was about. And then finally, there is the related, where it's going to tell you, hey, based on this mutual tag, we think these two articles are related. And that's really great to help you form connections among different papers that might be useful to you for a variety of things. A few tips just before we dive into those screenshots. With the auto tags that I mentioned, sometimes they can be really great, sometimes they're kind of lacking. So some people do choose to turn the auto tags off in Zotero. 
so it doesn't automatically pull what it thinks is important. But I personally have left my auto tags on, at least for now, that might change as I have more experience with the software. I think it generally does pull enough relevant information and I will add more tags rather than take away the ones that it gave me. You can also color code these tags. So for example, I'm currently doing a lot of research on ethnic identity development. So I can choose in Zotero that anytime I tag ethnic identity, I want it to be blue. And then I can seamlessly look and say, okay, everything that's blue fits into this one specific thing that I wanna look at. Another thing to know is that when you sort items in Zotero, it's going to actually put them into two places. They will live in your library and in the collection you sort them into. So even if you at some point decide, you know, this collection isn't as useful as I thought it would be, you can delete the collection, but still maintain all those articles in the library. And if you ever wanted to check what collections you put an item in, you can select the item and hold down option if you have a Mac or control for a PC, and it'll tell you all the different collections that you have placed this item into. Now, when we're using Zotero, I'm gonna talk about a few things. So first I'll show you guys how we can find articles, how you add them to your library, organizing your library and connection and collections, how to read and take notes, and then finally, how to export those references when you're done with your paper. So starting off, let's talk about finding articles and adding them to your library. So personally, I use Google Chrome. That is my browser of choice, and I have downloaded the Zotero plugin for Chrome. I don't know if they have plugins for other browsers, but I know a lot of people do use Chrome, so hopefully this is helpful. You can see right here that I've circled this little Z. That's the Zotero Z and it's just a little plugin on my Chrome. What's useful about this is that, let's say I'm in Google Scholar and I find an article that's really, really helpful to me. For example, if I wanted to find this article about using reference softwares among community college students, this seems something really relevant to what I'm talking about today, so I think I should save this article. If I come up here, you'll see the Z for whatever reason has turned into a piece of paper. I don't know why it does that, but I know that that is what this extension is. And if you hover over it, you can see it says save to Zotero and that it has access to this site. So when I'm on this article that is interesting and relevant to what I'm looking for, all I have to do is come up here and click on my save to Zotero little button there. When I do that, it's gonna bring out this little menu for me. And it's going to ask where I want to put it, which of my collections do I want to save this article to? So like I said, I've got different articles for different reasons and different collections. So the one that I chose to sort this into is a collection that I call IVC teaching because, you know, obviously this was for an IVC related presentation that I was giving. So I took this article and I chose to put it in IVC teaching. Down here, if I wanted to add tags, I could. It will automatically generate tags for me, like I said and it's going to save the full text PDF of this article. Now, what's really handy about this is that as long as I have access to this article, I can save the PDF into my Zotero account. I'm currently on campus, so that means that I had easy access to any article that I wanted to open up, and it told me, okay, here's your full text PDF. Once I click done, it's going to add this article into my IBC teaching collection, which is within my library. And remember, it's going to put it into the library and the collection. So if I ever delete the IBC teaching collection, it will still be in my library. Now, this is what Zotero looks like. It's basic, very, very simple. So here we see my library, all those different collections. I also have a publication section where I can save my own personal publications. I've got duplicate items where it will flag any item that I've saved multiple times. Anything that might be unfiled will be in the unfiled items. And then trash, obviously, is articles that I've thrown away. Now, when we're looking at this, you see a lot of useful information right off the bat. So this happens to be the only file in my IVC teaching collection. If there were more, you'd see a longer list underneath here. But we've got the use and awareness of the use and awareness of reference management software. And there's the full text PDF. I have a few things I can do here in terms of exporting, adding notes, adding attachments. If for some reason I had an attachment that was relevant to this article, I could add it right there. We've got the info provided by the article itself. So we've got the abstract, the authors, what journal it came from, when it was published, the date I accessed it, and we've got the DOI, which is very helpful because sometimes you can't find articles as easily and using a DOI is often the easiest way. 
So that's under the info tab here. We also have notes, tags, and related, which is the things I mentioned earlier. Notes would be if I add notes, I'll show you guys an example of that. Tags will be whatever tags I either manually assigned or were automatically added. And then related will show me any articles that I have in my library that are related to this one. Now, if I were to look at the tags here, you see that this was the tag that it automatically added. This is one of those examples where the auto tag wasn't very useful. It's a very long tag. It's not going to be as easy for me to search it. So I might add a tag saying community college students, uh, reference management software, library, something like that. Just break this phrase into multiple separate tags, but it is still really useful to be able to see just kind of quickly what are the big topics that this article is going to discuss. Now, if I wanted to add a note right here, this little post-it is how I can add a note to the entire article. And you see here now under the use and awareness title, we've got both the full text PDF and the note that I added. So I just wrote, I'm saving this article as an example for the Psi Beta workshop. So now that note has been tied to this article in my Zotero library. Now, if later on I wanted to find this again, I can always search in Zotero for Psi Beta Workshop, and it'll pull this note and this article up for me saying, hey, here's an example of you using that phrase, which super, super useful if you think of it from a research standpoint. If there's a specific construct or a measure, if you really want to find everything you have about the Big Five personality inventory, all you have to do is search Big Five, and it will give you every note that you have, every tag that you have about the Big Five. Now, when I go, sorry, let me go back real quick. Now, if I were to click here on the full text PDF, it will actually open up the PDF within Zotero itself. So you'll see here, I've got two tabs. This tab right here was the collection that we were just on and it added a new tab for me here of that article. So within this article now, I have the means to annotate it and take notes however I like. So I just added to the abstract for an example here. And I'm really interested in the fact that it says that a low awareness exists among community college students about reference management softwares, and they suggest increasing its use among community college students. So that seems interesting to me. That's something I want to remember for later. So I can use the highlighter function here to highlight it. And then I can use this note function here to just add a note right there where I wrote down RMS, meaning reference management software, is useful. That's something helpful that I want to remember. Now I can even add a tag to that note. If I write in the tag here, reference management, then that will also be a searchable tag for me within my entire Zotero library. And then kind of the next big thing that you'll wanna do that I think we will all be taking advantage of is like I said, you can have Zotero do all of the exporting and all of the reference work for you. So if you right click on any item in your library, it'll give you a few options. We can open the PDF, we can view it online, go back to the original source website that I downloaded this article from. I can look at the file, see it in the library. I can add a note here, like that same note that I did where I said I was saving this article. I can add a note from annotations. So if I annotated something and I want to make that a note here, like that comment that I just added to the abstract, I can do that. If I need to add an attachment, move it, add it to another collection, remove it from the collection. Those are all super easy things to do. I can duplicate it. I can trash the item. But then the interesting things come here at the bottom. I can export the item or I can create a bibliography from the item. And that's, I think, one of the coolest things that Zotero can do, which is create your entire bibliography for you. I'm going to be honest, I don't know what report it would generate. We can check that out later, but that's not a feature that I have used yet. So if I go and I click on create bibliography from item, I can do it based on this one item, or if I had a bunch of stuff here, I could select all of those items and create a bibliography. When I click on create a bibliography, it'll bring me here. It's going to ask me what style I want to create my bibliography in. As I said, since we're doing psychology, I choose APA 7. And I can ask it to give me citations, like an in-text citation, which great, because then I don't have to create those manually or I can ask it to spit out an entire bibliography for me. And then we have options on how we want to receive it. It can be saved as an RTF, which I believe stands for rich text file. 
that can be easily added into a Google Doc or a Word document. We can save it as an HTML, copy the entire thing to the clipboard, or just print it, which are all super, super useful things to do because now rather than having to go through and manually create every single reference that's going to go on my reference sheet, Zotero is going to do the entire thing for me. That saves, honestly, hours of time when you're working on massive, massive research projects. So that really is kind of my basic rundown of Zotero. I know I did not take much time at all with that, but I wanted to leave a lot of time here for me to talk to you guys about resources and answer questions that you might have about how to use it. I will send these slides to Sina so they can be made available to you guys, but just two reliable online resources you can use to learn more about this stuff. Uh, Purdue OWL has really, really great quick answers to APA formatting questions. It's something I still use regularly. So I wanted to give you guys that link. And then for Zotero, you can download it at Zotero.org. And if you go to Zotero.org slash support, they have a lot of step-by-step -step manuals and explanations on how you can use their software most effectively. So with that, I will go ahead and open up the floor. If you guys have questions, if you wanna talk about any specific part of Zotero, I am more than happy to answer whatever questions you guys have. Hey, Shereen. Hi, hey, Tricia. First of all, thank you so much. I think that was like the greatest thing I have encountered. <laughs> um, I do have two questions actually. Um, okay. So one of them you mentioned that, um, you know, when you're like just searching the article and then you decide to add it to Zotero, you go to the extension paper and over there you can add the tag. You also mm -hmm. mentioned that we can have the tag color coded. I was wondering yes. if you can color code it while you're still in that section while you're adding the tag. I don't think you can. I've tried to and it's never been a feature I've been able to use. I don't think it's enabled for the Chrome plugin specifically. Um, but what I usually do anyway is once it's been imported to Zotero is I will go back to my Zotero, make sure it filed to where I wanted it, make sure like sometimes it'll, if I click it twice, it'll accidentally download twice and I'll have a duplicate article. So I kind of always just go back and forth and check myself as I'm downloading to Zotero, just to make sure also like, so there are times when the PDF for whatever reason might not add to the library, it'll just for, give you the abstract. So it's always just good to double check that the software is doing what you want it to do. Okay, awesome. Thank you. And then my second question is, um, since probably a lot of us are doing group projects, I was wondering on how we can synchronize like all of us using the same Zotero. Is that a thing or do we all have to have individual like stuff? Yeah, so there is a way that you can make a Zotero like collection accessible to other people. So when you use Zotero, you do need to create an online account. So I have like one associated with my email and a password that I set. And within the collections feature, you can share your collection with other people. So if I'm on a group project with you, for example, I can say, hey, I want to add this email address. And then your account would then be linked to the collection as would mine. I do believe one person has to own the collection and they would have like the most rights over it in terms of you know making changes and things. But it's very, very accessible for collaboration. That's one of the best features about it is when you're working on group projects, you can easily save articles that everyone can then access. So um, just to clarify, does that mean that all members can add and do everything equally? Like by equally, I mean, like, can they all add articles? Can they all add tags? Or can they only see what I'm doing? From my understanding, everyone can add and tag things, but I don't think everyone has the power to delete or edit everyone else's tags and notes. Okay. That's reasonable. All right, thank you. That concludes my questions. And again, thank you so much for this lifesaver. I know, I wish that I had it when I was an undergrad. I was so, I've read so many articles that I would have saved in here. <laughs> <laughs> I can't imagine. <laughs> Sina? Yes, um, so I really, when I'm reading articles, I really like highlighting, um, just with my pen and writing stuff, uh, handwrite stuff. Can we do that on Zotero or not? That's a great question. I haven't tried, but I do know they have an iOS app that you can use with like an iPad and an Apple Pencil. I don't know specifically what the user interface is like, though, if you can just physically with the Apple Pencil mm -hmm. highlight and take notes. Um, I do know that like I can do it with a mouse. So I imagine you should be able to, but that's not something that I personally have tried yet. Okay, cool. Thank you.
And if it would be hey, helpful, Trisha. Have... Hi. This is free? This is free. Holy it is completely crap. free. I can't. I don't know. I can't imagine this right now. I have little research projects on every, like in almost every one of my classes right now. So being able to to, to separate those, I just kind of can't believe that this is free. It's unbelievable. And that's why I say like, it's so, so useful. And I highly recommend everyone to download it. Um, just to show you guys, this is their website, Zotero.org. It is your personal research assistant. It's a free, easy to use tool. So I personally have it downloaded on every device that I use. And you can see like, as you get more into it, I've only been using it for a year, but you can see here, this person has so many different things in here. It's organized by creator, by year. You can see full text PDFs, you can see books. It's all just like insane, the amount of things that you can do. And then here, this person has like a to read tag, like things that they still need to read. You can see the red here, that's one of their color coded tags and all the different tags that they added, 19th century, acclimation, age, blood, like all the things that are relevant to whatever their research is. So it's really, really cool that you have all this. And like I said, their website is super, super helpful. Um, I believe it's under documentation, yeah. So here under documentation, you can see all the different things and all these great resources that they give you access to. So you can learn how to use Zotero most effectively. I honestly could have gone on for hours, but I wanted to give you guys kind of an overarching understanding of the software, but I have spent hours just reading things and understanding how to use it the best. You said you have it on everything. Do you like it on your phone? Like, do you feel like it's efficient on your phone? I have it on my phone only because there was one specific day that someone asked me about a research article that I had read that I knew was saved in my Zotero library. Uh, I personally am not a big fan of reading text heavy things on my phone. I feel like it creates a lot of eye strain. So that's the only reason I personally don't choose to use it. But if it's useful to you, I definitely could see that being, you know, helpful. Setting the stage. I'm really lazy. So I would like to lay down and read. <laughs> do so you, you're do you like me with my iPad. Like... Yeah, that's too much work, though. One hand. <laughs> yeah, I think you could definitely manage that. Cool. Thank you. I'm um, I'm actually downloading now. <laughs> yeah, literally everyone just go download Zotero right now. <laughs> but I'm happy to answer any other questions, too. Uh, I don't have a question, but everyone who is about to download it, you can really do it really fast. I downloaded all this, both of the softwares, made an account, registered on both before, like in like five minutes. It, I was sold. Thank you for sharing this. Yeah. Tool. It's like absolutely the coolest thing ever. I, when I told Sina about, it, I was like, I need to tell you guys about this software because everyone needs to use it. It doesn't matter if you're in psychology or if you are reading research articles, you need Zotero. Yeah, I think I originally had something else uh, planned for her to talk about. And then she showed me Zotero and I was like, nope, you're doing a workshop on this because it's going to help everyone. Yeah, I'm not joking. I was upset that it took me this long to, <laughs> to like, start using a reference management software because it just made my life leaps and bounds easier. Yeah, so everyone go download it. <laughs> yeah, go download um, Zotero. I was wondering if you could show us how we can tag stuff in the software, because I think that, that that should be helpful for everyone. Yeah, so let me just make sure I've got it. Okay. So here you can see my library, all these different things that I'm reading. I'll come to my IVC teaching collection, because that's where I have this example article. If you click on it, and then you come right here to tags, I can add a tag right here. And you see it shows blue because that's the color that I've been using a lot. So I can say uh, Psi Beta just for my own fun. So right there, that's my new tag, Psi Beta. And then it's going to show up there. Also, like I said, we've got the notes showing up here. I can add more notes to here or I can open up my full text PDF again and annotate it in there. So how do you color coordinate it then? Let's see here. Give me one sec. I think I have to share my whole desktop because otherwise it won't show my right click. Just minimizing everything else on my desktop.
my stuff. Sorry, guys, my Zoom froze. It's okay. You weren't in a weird position where I could like see up your nose or anything like that. So you're good. Oh, I'm so I'm so thankful for that. I got a pretty good one of Lily last year where she was paused and I was like, yep, see straight up your nose right now. No, you don't. I mean, I haven't showed anyone. <laughs> but yeah, if you guys do weird stuff, I usually take screenshots. Let me see. I'm pretty sure I have a funny one of Mike. Hold on. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> Just exposing everybody. <laughs> this meeting is being recorded, by the way. <laughs> He's not going to watch it. <laughs> so if I can you guys see when I right click on the tag yeah. here? Yeah, yeah. yeah. So when I right click, it's supposed to give me the option to change the color. I don't know why it's not, but that is how you change it is by right clicking on the tag. I don't know okay. why it's not letting me do it right now. I'm sorry, Shireen, but that's how you do it. Thanks. <laughs> Thank you. I'm trying. I'm trying my best, guys. <laughs> technology okay. doesn't cooperate. I think we all understand that. Just technology sometimes just doesn't want to do anything. Yeah, I think you guys understand a lot of the professor's struggle, too, of being in charge of Zoom rooms and moderating all of this. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Do you have, like, one thing that you would say you use this for the most? Like, if if you had to pick, like, one feature that you're like, this is the one, this is what sets it apart from every other kind of program. What do you like about it? Um, to be honest with you, I haven't spent a lot of time with other reference management softwares. I really, really liked Zotero. It was the first one that I was taught. Uh, I think for me, the biggest thing is just being able to organize and save articles in one place because previously I just had folders all over my computer full of articles that I had read. And those articles were full of my notes and highlights and things. But when I wanted to find something specific, I would have to go searching through so many different things like I always have like master word docs where I keep like an annotated bibliography essentially so first I'd have to go to the annotated bibliography find the article that I'm thinking of and then go find that article in another folder find the specific note on that article and it just takes forever this is just so much easier because everything is just in one place also Shreen I got it to work now I can show you how to recolor it um okay so not here you right click it here this is, these are the tags that are associated with this article. If I right click here, assign color, I can choose purple. And it is now a purple tag. <laughs> purple time is fun time. Um, my question is, so if you just click on the article, then that bottom tags just appears? Let's go through together. So you mean if I just click on this? Yeah. Okay, let me come up to, so if I click on it, it just comes, it'll show me the tags because that was the like window that I was most recently looking at. If I go to info, it'll show me that, but it'll go to whichever of these things you were most recently using. Uh, I mean, that wasn't my question, but my question was that, so you know how where you add the color is in that tiny left corner? Yeah, so that yeah. just appears automatically once you go into the folder. It's always here actually. So it's okay. showing these are different like tags that it's found based on, you know, articles Perfect. in here. So it'll show me all of my different tags. And then it'll also show me my tags by folder. So for example, one of my advisors is named Jason and I saved a bunch of his research into here. So if I click on here, it would show me any tags that I had saved Jason's research as well. But then right now, since Cybeta is the only tag I've used recently, if I try to click on it, nothing's going to happen because I don't have anything tagged Cybeta in my folder called Jason's Research. If I come to my IBC teaching folder, then it'll show me this is the one tag that I have that automatically came in. And then this is my Cybeta tag. If I had multiple items in here and I clicked on this, it would show me which ones have Cybeta tag only. It would remove the ones that don't have that tag. Does that make sense? 100%. Yeah, thank you. I'm gonna stop sharing because I like being able to see you guys. Um, if you guys have questions, please ask them. This is a really, um, Hardish is a really great resource and this is really, really important and helpful software. So um, take advantage of this. Did you make that picture of Mike your background? Oh my God. <laughs> We're, We're just like, hanging out. I love this picture because you can tell he's slightly frustrated with me. 
like he's happy mike loves me but he's also like pursing his lips and he's like god damn it (laughs) so i like this one a lot here's a funny one of lily but you can't even tell (laughs) at least she has her hair curled (laughs) it was it looked great that day that was the point it didn't look great it looked great when i first oh that's the best one yeah (laughs) I have one and I can't I think it's on my laptop because I'm on my desktop right now but it's like this where it's like Tyler in like every in front of like every picture of him looking just over it like he always does those pictures Sorry. of Tyler are great please please continue here I'll here we go I'll um perfect Please continue asking questions because this is really cool. I'm actually messing around with it right now. So I want to make sure you guys, but you were like, I like seeing you. And I was like, I haven't brushed my hair, like my teeth and it's one, but okay. Just for you. We appreciate it. And Noor, you're right. Like this would be so great to share with like writing classes and the psych two classes. I figured Cybeta was a good way to get the foot in the door, but I am going to encourage everyone in our department to learn and teach this if they can, because it's just made my life so, so much easier. Yeah, I remember when I was doing my annotated bibliography for Psych 2, I would get like so confused because I was like, where did I leave those comments on which article was it? So the tags sound like they'll be really helpful. Absolute lifesavers, honestly. Plus, I mean, as you read articles, they all start to blend together at a certain point. I don't remember, like, there's a a researcher named Lerner who's very, very informative in the positive youth development space. And so I read probably 15 Lerner articles a year because I just am always, always reading whatever he puts out. And I have no idea which specific Lerner article it was that said this thing that I need to cite. But because of Zotero, I can go figure it out very easily. Um, Patricia, I have a question. I'm not sure if you answered earlier or not, but um, can you import um, articles that you already have downloaded into it? Absolutely, you can. Uh, Let's see here. So right here. Right here. I can enter an ISBN, DOI, or other bib codes. I don't know what that means, but I always use DOI. Any article that you find is going to have a DOI. You can do that. Or you can right here, just add in a file. So I would personally just store a copy of the file in here and import it that way. Or, you know, if I click on import a journal article, it's going to ask me what's the title, what's all the information about it. And then I can attach the PDF there as well. But I just like adding a copy for me. I think that's usually the easiest way to go. All right, thank you. That's awesome. So what I'm and hearing then, is that my entire folder on my computer that is currently labeled Psi Beta Mental Health Chair is going to go into this. <laughs> yes, into your new collection named Psi Beta Mental Health Chair. But then it's great too, because if, so I'll share a story with you guys, actually. When I was in the middle of submitting all my applications to grad school, my computer crashed and I lost so, so many important files that I needed for those applications. And luckily at the time, Google Drive was like the coolest thing. So I had uploaded a lot of it to Google Drive, but now I don't have the fear of losing my articles or losing my notes on my articles because like I said, Zotero will sync across all your devices and everything is saved in their cloud. So if my laptop, if I am exhausted tonight and I fall asleep and spill a cup of coffee on my laptop, I can still access everything off my desktop. You said that you could look it up by DOI. Mm -hmm. Is it like, it's through your browser. So if I'm already signed into whatever like database system that I have access to, it can, I can still put in the DOI and it could just pull it off there. Or do I have to like sign in again kind of thing? Yeah, so if you were to do it by DOI, it's not going to be as seamless because it Zotero itself doesn't have access to articles and it doesn't, if you're searching through a library database, for example, Zotero doesn't necessarily know that. So the easiest way to import into Zotero is going to be with that Chrome plugin that I showed you guys, because like, I mean, I can for, we can just do one together for fun. We have time. All right, let's do this. Someone give me a topic that interests them. Sleep. (laughs) All right, let's go with sleep psychology. 
clinical psychology training and sleep disorders. This is fascinating. I really, really want to save this to my Zotero. So all I need to do is come here. Like I said, for whatever reason, it turns it into a piece of paper rather than just saying Zotero, but I know that's what this plugin is. So I click on it and it'll give me this kind of smaller window view, which I can use, but I always like to expand it and make sure that it's going where I want it to. So I click on that arrow and then I've got all of these things. Now tags, I'm gonna tag it sign up because sign is the one who wanted me to look it up. And then I just click done. And now it has been saved to my Zotero library. So if I go, I think I need to, let me adjust my sharing real quick. So now if I come here, it sometimes takes a second for it to process the tags you added, but there it is. It tagged it as Sina because it knows that I wrote Sina when I did it. So now it knows that Sina is the tag here. I've got the entire article because I had access to the PDF. So if I just click on it, it'll open it. I can either open it in the browser or I can open it in here once it finishes importing. It does take a few minutes for it to kind of process and finish doing whatever it's doing. But as soon as it's ready for me, I'll be able to access it right there. Uh, professor, can you um, go over the process of, I, I know Shireen asked earlier, I, I had the same question of like, um, you know, being able to connect to someone else's folder, like, is that relatively simple or can you walk us through that? To be honest with you, it's not something that I have personally had to do yet. I just know oh. that it is very easy because people in my lab use this software and have said that it's very seamless. Um, we can try and learn together, but that's not something I know how to do off the top of my head. Okay. Let's see. And that's why I said that their Zotero website is so, so useful. All right. So I'm going to go back to that browser. This is that Zotero.org slash support. So right here, there's a section called syncing collaboration and backup. So let's go to groups. And it looks like I need to make a new library and a new group. And then I can just go ahead and have a group there and save all of our stuff to one library together. And the cool thing about that is it separates it from my library. So nobody else is able to mess with things that I don't want touched. It's all in the shared library rather than my personal library. Cool, I see. Yeah, sorry, I don't have a lot of experience with that. I just know it's easy. Oh, don't worry. I. I, I'll take any information I can get. Just go that's, to zotero.org slash support. Yeah, okay. We're just going to stare at each other. I can't unmute Pretty myself. <laughs> yeah, if you guys... Um, have questions, please ask them. Um, I think we can wait until 125 even. So you can, you can, you don't have to unmute yourself to ask questions. You can totally put them in the chat too, if that's something you're more comfortable with. Also tell all your friends to download Zotero, save everybody some time. Oh yeah, if you have friends in Psych 2 especially, yeah. I think, this will be really helpful for them. <laughs> Cause like Noor said, I remember being in Psych 2 when I had so many articles and I was just overwhelmed, so. Yeah, does Carrie know about this? I know she was here, but no, I don't think I see her anymore. Um, I I saw Carrie and I mentioned that we're doing a workshop on this. Um, I don't know if she knows, knows about this, but she might. They had a yeah. library workshop last year that I did at IVC that was, it was like a similar program, but this seems way more intuitive. So that's why I was like, it'd be helpful. And same with writing too. Like, I think I had more um, references for writing too for that. Cause that project lasts like the whole semester. So I had like three pages of reference of just references by the end. So I think that that would be like, this would have been amazing for that. So you should tell Emily. Always tell yeah. Emily Lou everything. She's just an angel that walks this earth. 
it's also like personal preference. I just so happen to be in grad school where we are constantly trying to figure out the easiest way to do things to save ourselves time. So I attended a workshop on Zotero over summer, which is how I learned about it. But I mean, there's a lot of other softwares out there. I just don't know a lot about them. I think the one, Brittany, you're talking about is RefWorks. Um, so that one is similar in a sense of like, you can add your articles also like through, um, uh, it's not necessarily an extension, but like if you go through the library databases, if you wanna like, um, I don't remember what you press exactly, but it just like adds it to your ref work. And you can also do the citation and your bibliography. But I think the benefit that Zotero has that ref work does not is the whole tags and like the searching stuff where like that one is just kind of having the citations for you and references. Yeah, and I cannot like emphasize enough how much I love being able to take notes on the articles itself. That is just how I've always liked to read. So being able to do it within the software has been amazing. And like I, I said, anyone... I will share my slides if you guys want to use, see them later. I don't know if this means anything to anyone, but um, I went through the process of making a group um, collection, a group library. And um, it's very easy and it's super easy to add people. I literally just did it between the time that we just talked about. Super easy. I love that you're just doing this as we're having the conversation. So you can be like, <laughs> oh yeah, it is actually great. That's what I'm doing I know, too. I need to, and I'm I feel like me my... and Joshua would have been friends if I wouldn't have left. Joshua, oh. you seem great. Oh, thanks. I'm going to try and get my uh, Psych2 research group on board with this. Um, they're pretty, uh, they, they seem to like to be efficient too. I think they'll enjoy it. Um, you can even talk about it in your site two class because that's true. Everyone that's true. can use it. I'll let the professor know. Maybe she'll send out an announcement letting people know. Which professor is it? Um, is it a talker, right? I'm so sorry. I don't, hold it's on. It's all right. <laughs> Sorry. If they want okay. to talk to me about it, just let them know that I'm happy to talk to any faculty members that want to know more about it to teach it. Okay. Okay, are there any more questions? I'm going to guess no. Okay. <laughs> well, thank you, Hart Trisha, for this amazing workshop. I, I know we're all going to use it, so this is going to be really helpful. We appreciate you a lot. Um, we do have some time, and I know that Brittany wants to make some announcements and talk about some stuff. So um, I'm going to give the floor to Brittany. She's going to make some announcements, and then we can move on with our site printer meeting. Hi, I'm back. <clears throat> um, so I am still serving on the Executive Student Council for WPA. And the biggest thing I wanted you guys to know that WPA is coming up. It's we're opening for submissions. I can get those dates for you. I didn't know I was going to do this day or I had made it, made it very pretty for you and made you a PowerPoint. But um, for research submissions, you guys are in the best spot to do this. We had so many people that weren't really like super active in Cybeta or they couldn't be. But Cybeta does fund us to go to WPA. It's in Riverside this year. Hopefully we'll still get to, well, you'll get to still stay in hotels and hang out with each other. But just a heads up, that looks so great, personal research, um, as well as group research. So keep in mind, you can do your Psych2 project. That's exactly what I did. I did my Psych2 project and I presented that at WPA and it was really great. So make sure you're doing that. The other thing I wanna talk about is um, I got the Jack Kent Cook scholarship last year and it's a really, I didn't realize it at the time, but it's a really big deal and it does a lot of things for you. I'm going to put together a list and I have some materials, but I joined a program through them that's basically outreach, making more people want to apply for this scholarship. Now, the cool thing about this scholarship is, and what draws most people in, is it's funding up to $200,000. And what I think is really important to say is it is up to, meaning that if it was $200,000 for me to go to Columbia, they'll pay for that. If it was only $50,000, that's what they'll pay. So it's whatever your cost of attendance is. So that's one thing, but it goes so much further than that. And that's, I think the biggest thing. So 
so far, Jack Kent Cook has already allowed me a lot of things. They will pay for one conference every year up to uh, $1,600. So if I, right now I'm looking at, there's a psychology conference in Brussels. I'm looking at it and I just fill out a thing and they approve it and you can go. Another real cool thing is it allows you to take unpaid internships because they will pay you a certain amount. They pay you research stipends. They pay for um, a computer. The first, so I won the transfer scholar. So I get a computer at the beginning of, um, I think it's a $2,000 stipend. Like this, though it may not. So for me, I almost got a full ride into UCI. So technically Jack Kent Cook only paid like the little bit that was left over for my cost of living, which was, I mean, I'm so grateful. It was awesome. But it was obviously at first I was shocked. I was like, oh my God, I thought I won this amazing like $200,000 thing. And I'm getting like, $5,000, which again, amazing. But what I didn't realize is the more I'm learning about this program, the more they offer. So something else I'm doing with them is we do affinity groups once a month. Um, I facilitate our re-entry or non-traditional student facilitator, and we just talk about how things are going. So there's a really big community within this. There's a ton of internships because all the Cook Scholars have now moved on to do amazing things. And so you can get into almost any industry. They have their own like LinkedIn. So it's it's just something that keeps on giving. And what's even crazier is 90% of the Cook Scholars that you get the initial scholarship and you want to go to grad school, 90% are covered through grad school. So it's, I had no idea that the benefits were going to be this huge. And so I really want to make sure the um, application is open. It just opened on October 1st. And I'll send Sinus some stuff to put in the recap for it. But it is so much more than just the next two years of your life. They do pay up to three also for transfer scholars. So I sat down and I was talking to, that. yet you have your own counselor through them as well that keeps you on track that you check in with. And they also will give you like, hey, you're amazing. You're cool, but chill out a little, like let's relax. And that was a big thing that they had to tell me was you can do this in three years if you want. Like that was my biggest thing. I got to UCI and I was like, oh my God, I have to hit the ground running. They're like, if it takes you three years, you're funded up to three years. Take the time you need. And I think that that's huge. I think that a lot of us don't realize that extra year could could really make a difference in what grad schools we apply to or what programs we're interested in. And I know a lot of the people here are interested in grad school. So I really think that you guys should look into this scholarship it's all backgrounds. I think it was one of the coolest things. Um, they also, over the summer, they pay for you to go to Washington for something called Scholars Weekend, and you get to meet everyone else. And it's a three-day trip. It was really cool. We got to have a fancy dinner and a museum. It was neat. Um, but on top of that, you learn about all these opportunities they give you because they want you to know it's not just the funding that you're getting. You're getting so much more. And so I really wanted to push that because I had, when I was applying to it, I just knew it was a big scholarship and that was kind of it and had someone, and I'm going to probably go through um, Alyssa, who's our scholarship director at IVC and kind of put on a bigger presentation in this with a lot less me trying to pull off the top of my head what um, all the benefits of this and something a little bit more organized, but please apply to this scholarship. It is so worth it. And there are so like, I can't tell you how many people were sitting there and like, I never thought I would get this because I felt the same way. They actually, the first two hours of the scholars weekend was explaining like, Hey, stop feeling like an imposter. You belong here. It's okay. Because we all did. And when I got it, I like, I could, I couldn't believe it. I was like, there's no way that I measure up to everyone else in this room. That's doing all these amazing things. But I genuinely have like, I've worked with so many of you people inside beta and you guys are all so amazing you've accomplished so much like don't limit yourself there's also there's a ton of other scholarships like this one so like the coca-cola one's really big and really good too i can't speak as much to that but apply to as many scholarships as you can um i'll make sure well i know that sign is going to update you guys when they open i got eight scholarships from ivc last year so please apply to all the scholarships they had um for the last two years i was talking to emily lou about this they had under like the lowest numbers of people applying to scholarships ever so apply to the scholarships at ivc they're awesome and not just that you get to connect with people i think the biggest thing for me this last year um two of the scholarships i i got were memorial scholarships and 
it, it, they genuinely changed me. Like one of them was a young lady who was actually in Beta and she passed away during her time at IVC. And I met with her family and now her family checks in with me like every week. I bought them a little gift when I got the scholarship. It's, it was really an amazing experience. So you can really change things for a family because these people are, at least in this case, they were looking for someone to kind of live on their daughter's legacy. And so when I graduated and made, grad, I made a graduation cap for her too. And so when I went to UCI, I told them, here's my classes. I bet she'd be interested in this one. And like, no, you don't have to go that far, but it, it really can be something that is bigger than, than you. But the biggest one I want to talk about is Jack Kent Cook because you guys, I net like they're doing so much. Please, please apply to the scholarship and also please do research and do WPA because um, I'm sure we'll have, I'm sure Sign is going to do a talk at some point about research labs. I have a ton to say about that. And WPA is a big part of why I've been as successful as I have. So please do WPA. But that's it. Thank you. Thank you so much, Brittany. Um, and yes, I will, um, after you send me the links and everything, I will put it in the meeting recap so you guys can have access to it and you can look at the deadlines and yeah, that'll be sent to you guys. Okay. Um, oh, I, I, I couldn't find the share screen button here. <laughs> that was scaring me. Um, all right. So um, now before we get into the mental health segment we have a few announcements that we're going to make so take it away okay so first of all we have inductions that are coming up and it's happening on november 18th for um those of you who are not certain what the inductions are it's basically just you becoming an official member of psi beta um and we are currently taking applications as of now and the requirements are um, for becoming an official member is just maintaining a 3.25 GPA, completing um, a college level psychology class with a B or higher, and um, the completion of 12 college units. And also you have to pay a $50 membership fee. That's like just like a one-time thing, um, which enables a lifetime membership. So you just pay it once and then you're an official member for basically ever. <laughs> and then there's also a link to a Google form that is already posted on the Discord. And it'll also be um, posted in the chat very soon by one of our officers. Um, and the form will be sent um, as of Canvas um, as well, just in case um, you guys are not interested in going through like Discord. And then if you're also interested in becoming an official member, please like click on the link and follow the directions. Um, just like fill up your information basically. Um, another part for you, like another process, is that you need to book an appointment with Dr. Tucker, which um, I believe Sina will help you out with that. Um, basically what it is, it's very simple. Um, she just like meets with you guys over Zoom. And um, you know how you go, you go on your my site? And then when you go on your my site, you just pull up your transcript and you just have to share your screen so she can confirm your GPA and stuff in your 12 um, units as well. Um, that is like very important like you can't become a member unless she can like clarify that you are indeed um like you have a 3.5 3.25 gpa and your units um yeah so that you have to have the meeting before the deadline um which will also be given and we're excited to have new members join yes something i do want to stress is that uh have your transcript ready before your meeting with Dr. Tucker, because your meeting is only for 10 minutes. And um, if you don't have it ready before your meeting, then it's gonna take a long time and then the meetings are gonna get pushed back. And it's just a lot easier if you just have your transcript open and then it just, everything's, everything goes smoothly. And uh, yes, the, the link to the Google form is already in Discord. Um, I'm gonna try to send it in the chat. Um, I can't because I'm sharing my screen, but um, if one of the officers can do that, please share it in the chat right now. And I'm also gonna send it in Canvas so you guys can have access to that. Even if you are just interested in uh, attending the induction ceremony, you can go over there and then check that you're just interested in attending the ceremony. You don't have to go through the process of clicking your um, cl clicking that you um, satisfy, satisfy the requirements. So it's if you are interested in going, go check out the Google form. And if you do wanna be inducted, 
all of the questions will be asked there. The link to the um, sign up sheet is in the Google form, and you also have access to the Zoom link through the Google form as well. So everything is in that Google form. If you want to become inducted, if you want to attend the ceremony, it's going to be there. So now I'll be talking about merch. We have our merch for uh, sale available now. And here is the Google form to purchase. We have hats, shirts, and hoodies, and also polo, all in different designs, different sizes. You can pick, and if you purchase a hat, a t-shirt, and a hoodie, then you get a 10% discount off of your entire order. So be sure to buy it. We have limited supply as well. so. Get to it. <laughs> now I'd like to introduce the members of SciBeta's national research team. So we'd like to congratulate Sam Warren, Deborah Hotchkiss, Joshua Telez, Ruby Baragan, and Rin Lee for getting accepted into the team. We had 10 excellent applicants this year and we're really thankful to everyone who applied and we're really looking forward to working with everyone this year. And now I'd like to introduce the mental health segment with Sam. Okay, Sam, I think you should be able to share your screen. Okay, let me set it up on this end first. Okay, oh goodness. That's not working. Okay, can you all see that? Yes. All right, and now. Okay, let me, I'm having trouble with PowerPoint because I'm good like that. There we go. All right, I'm really excited about this topic. So we're going to talk about sleep hygiene today, um, which sometimes people don't necessarily think of as affecting psychology, psychological health and mental health because it's physical, but trust me, you do not want to be sleep deprived. <laughs> I'm going to start you off with one of the most famous quotes from William Shakespeare. It's from Hamlet. To be or not to be, that is the question. Whether it is nobler in the mind to suffer the slings and arrows of outrageous fortune, or to take arms against a sea of troubles, and by opposing them, end them, to die, to sleep. No more, and by a sleep, to say we end the heartache and the thousand natural shocks that flesh is heir to. Tis a consummation devoutly to be wished, to die, to sleep, to sleep, perchance to dream, aye, there's the rub. For in that sleep of death, what dreams may come when we have shuffled off this mortal coil must give us pause. Basically, Hamlet was super emo and he really wanted to kill himself. And then he went, but what if death is like sleeping and I dream for all of eternity? And that would be no bueno. So what is sleep? What we know about sleep physically is that it is an altered state of consciousness, but it is not actually unconsciousness. Like if you pass out, that's different than being asleep. While you are asleep, your heart and your respiration slow down. Cellular repair takes place uh, throughout the body and you get physical rest, which is good. Now, psychologically, what we know about sleep is that the brain organizes your memories of the day. We don't know exactly how that happens. There are two or three different mechanisms by which it could, but it consolidates your memories. There are two kinds of sleep. There's non-rapid eye movement sleep and rapid eye movement sleep, and you go through them in a cycle. It used to be that we thought that dreaming occurred only in REM sleep, but now we know that it occurs in all times of types of sleep. It's just that the sort of what we think of as a dream with it's like a weird narrative story that does happen in REM sleep. So then there was a study from LaSalle University in 2012, which I really appreciated it because it was on graduate students in clinical psychology. I figured we could probably all you know, identify with those folks. They were surveying on a great number of things and there was a significant correlation found between healthy sleep practices and lower perceived stress levels. Uh, 
in the interest of being accurate, I also want to say that higher levels of social support were also positively correlated with lower perceived stress levels. So then there was a study specifically about what sleep hygiene is. It was published in 2006. Uh, the participants were psychology students at a Midwestern university. The participants did self-report surveys of both the sleep hygiene index and the Epworth sleepiness scale, which talks about daytime sleepiness. And the results were pretty clear that sleep hygiene was significantly correlated to quality of sleep. And because I want to talk, give you something useful uh, for all this, we're going to talk about what is on that sleep hygiene index. The important thing to know is that proper sleep hygiene is that you answer no to these questions. <laughs> So the in things on the sleep hygiene index, I take daytime naps lasting two or more hours. Probably not a great idea for nighttime sleep. I go to bed at different times from day to day. If you can stick to a schedule, that's better. Ben Franklin was wrong, by the way, when he was like, you have to go to bed early and get up early. What's important is actually that you go to bed and get up at about the same time. So if you are naturally a night owl and you're shifted off by a couple hours, that doesn't mean your sleep hygiene is bad. Get out of bed at different times from day to day. Try not to do that. I exercise to the point of sweating within an hour of going to bed. Now, exercise has been shown to help with sleep, but you actually want to do it a couple of hours before you go to bed so that you have time to like come down from the high of exercising before you sleep. I stay in bed longer than I should two or three times a week. Probably not the best idea if you're trying to get consistent sleep. Obviously, alcohol, tobacco, and caffeine within four hours of going to bed or after going to bed generally going to disrupt your sleep. Um, this one is great in the era of phones and books and tablets. I do something that may wake me up before bedtime. Generally, if you can, it is suggested that you try and reserve your sleep routine for sleepy things and don't like, you know, respond to the text messages that ding on your phone until you wake up. I go to bed feeling stressed, angry, upset, or nervous. You've heard, don't go to bed angry. That does not just apply to relationships. That also applies to whether or not you want to get a good night's sleep. I use my bed for things other than sleeping or sex. Uh, generally, it is assumed for proper sleep hygiene that daily activities should happen not in your bed and possibly not even in your bedroom if you're trying to train yourself to associate your bed with sleeping. Uh, I sleep on an uncomfortable bed. Not going to get great sleep that way. Sleep in an uncomfortable bedroom. Also not going to get great sleep. I do important work before bedtime. Try and give yourself a couple of hours before you go to bed to just putter and do enjoyable things that calm you down. And then the last one is I think, plan, or worry when I'm in bed, which is probably when a lot of us do our thinking, planning, and worrying, but it's not helping us sleep at all. <laughs> Uh, so in conclusion, the best way to have better quality sleep is to establish better quality uh, habits, which can be difficult because our modern world does not really lend itself to doing these things, but they're just things to keep in mind. And the other thing is that, like many things, this is not a pass-fail. You know, if you can establish a couple of good sleep habits, it's better than having none. And if you can just make a couple of your sleep habits slightly better than they were yesterday, that's better than, you know, making no progress at all. Uh, and so sweet dreams. Here are all of our works cited. That was really awesome, Sam. Thank you. I think it was so well put and easily guided and made us all realize our beautiful flaws. <laughs> Very relevant, very can relevant. I, can I add something? Like which sleep? Uh, probably it's not related. It's fine. I'm going anyway. But um, I think hot showers really help you feel more sleepy and helps you get more energy in the morning. Um, for a personal experience, like I just recently tried hot shower because uh, I jog in the morning. So like I just compare not shower, not taking hot shower prior to jogging versus um taking a hot shower before jogging and the energy that i had taking hot shower was so good like i run more miles than i do without hot shower so yeah it does really give give you more energy and also like makes you more sleepy just in case you guys 
can't really sleep. Uh, Certainly Ryan. anything that makes people, like whatever it is that makes you relax, like in your case, it's hot water. Uh, in my case, it's, you know, a nice cup of green tea, right? Like it's just, that's going to be highly individual. But yes, if you can find something relaxing to do, uh, sort of to indicate it's bedtime now, you may find you get better quality sleep. Uh, also, Ryan, I think it should be, since you're testing this out for us, <laughs> I think you should go do a test run of cold water as well, and then compare your results of cold water, then run versus- I won't be able to sleep. I will not be able to sleep in them. No, not. you got to do it first, man. <laughs> uh, okay. For science. Challenge accepted. Yeah. <laughs> Ryan does cold showers in the morning to feel awake. That's that's what he does. Torture. It's torture. <laughs> also, you go running for for fun. What is this? No, hey, running also... is super great, dude. Hey, I think I told you, right, Brittany? Like, I, I know. Just, uh, I'm during, making fun of in you. Oregon. Like, I try. I took cold shower every morning. I don't care if it's like cold. I just do it. <laughs> running is good for when like tires are chasing you. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> yeah, I agree. And tigers are not afraid of the water. That's the even scarier part. <laughs> and I live in a continent where tigers exist. <laughs> well, thank God I'm here in America now. So. so what I got from your presentation, Sam, is I should not. Is that a, wait, hold on. No, I know your dog's name. It's <laughs> Cinder? Cinder. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Um. Hi, Cinder. Uh, I should not be reading my textbook or research papers in bed before before I go to sleep. I mean, if that is the sort of thing that relaxes you, sure. But if it like does not relax you, then maybe you know put them down and pick up something like a, a trashy YA novel or something before bed. <laughs> Question what is good to know. caffeine. It said. Within four hours of going to bed or after going to bed, that doesn't mean yeah. I have to get up in the morning, right? That means no, no. But it like so. Yeah, it means like don't drink a cup. Don't be like I'm gonna go to bed with this cup of coffee. Okay, good. That's what I thought. <laughs> I was like, this is something new about waiting for caffeine in the morning because I could not do that. <laughs> no, no. It's um, most people obviously. Um, all of this gets thrown out of the window if you have someone with like ADHD, because of course stimulants calm them down. But for someone who's got a neurotypical brain, you typically don't want to have caffeine within four hours of trying to sleep because it will keep you awake. Yes, for sure. Thank you. Is anyone typical these days? I mean, I my household is all full of non-neurotypical people, but I'm sure some exist out there. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, does anyone have any questions for Sam? Oh, do you have a link to that sleep hygiene like questionnaire? I know it's gonna be bad. Like it the is, answers, yeah. I just wanna know. <laughs> so uh <laughs> it is it it's in the in it's in the study um that was in the journal behavioral medicine, which is on my slides. So you'll be able to go look it up. It's one of those like assess how bad the fire is because I know it's on fire but I don't know how bad it is yet yeah um in case you don't know I love sleep it's it's one of my favorite favorite topics to read about and learn about so yeah just a little personal note in there okay um thank you for that presentation Sam thank you so much um I'm going to share my screen yet again um this is just for your information. It's the same as before, except for the Discord link because that changes. You can you can con uh, connect with us through um, Instagram, and you can also check out the uh, Facebook page. But the best way to contact us is through Discord. And if you're not on the Canvas shell already, if you filled out the uh, attendance form, you will be. I will send you an invitation um, by the end of this weekend. Um, and yeah, that's Brittany. Yeah, look. Brittany in the middle, and that's Lily and Alicia. And look, we have so many, like, so many USA Beta members here. Um, yeah. So also fill out the connections form, please, please, please. It's 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 a great, great opportunity. I cannot recommend it enough. Please do it. Um, I'm gonna stop sharing.
Uh, I think Ryan's going to take a screenshot of us being here so we can post it on our Instagram. So if you feel comfortable with that, please keep your camera on or turn your camera on. And if you do not feel comfortable with that, please turn it off. Wait, I'm not sure if my screenshot would work. If it doesn't work, I'll do it. Like, yeah, no worries. Well. Okay, Shereen, I'm going to let you do it because my laptop does something weird too. Okay, then we will have a countdown going three. Wait, hold on, hold on. Three, two, one. And then one more. Three, two, one. All right, okay, I'll be sending this out to Saina and you guys shall see yourself soon. <laughs> yeah, okay, well, um, that's pretty much it. Thank you for coming. Um, our meeting is done, but I mean, I'm going to hang out for a little while, and I, I think some of the officers are going to hang out. If you want to hang out, please do. We would love to chat with you.